morning and welcome to the Cathedral of St. Paul. I'm Melinda and uh, we're glad you've joined us this morning for worship. A couple of announcements in our life together. The Lenten season offerings continue. Formation on Tuesday evenings, prayer beads online on Wednesdays and Stations of the Cross Friday afternoons. This coming Sunday is Taize in the afternoon. And just a reminder that this Thursday, the Kenyan College Choir will be here performing music, and we hope that you are able to come and invite some folks. It should be really lovely to hear such uh, gifted students sing. There is more information in the back of your bulletin about Meals to the Homeless and getting involved in that, as well as lots of information about the eclipse. So if you don't know where you're watching it or you want to go up to St. Mark's because apparently it's in some sort of direct line of something, solar, uh, you know, you can do that. So there's information about that in the back of the bulletin. So welcome to worship to the space. As we gather here, I invite you to draw your whole self into the space. We come from so many different places on a Sunday morning after what might have been a long week or a short week. But I invite you just to take a moment and breathe and feel yourself filled with the Spirit of God. And worship will begin in a moment.
Bless the Lord who forgives all our sins. Jesus said the first commandment is this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is the only Lord. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Let us pray. Almighty God, you know that we have no power in ourselves to help ourselves. Keep us both outwardly in our bodies and inwardly in our souls, that we may be defended from all adversities which may happen to the body and from all evil thoughts which may assault and hurt the soul. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. A reading from the book of Exodus. Then God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above or that is on the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of parents to the third and fourth generations of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. For six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work. You, your son or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock, or the alien resident in your towns. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, but rested 
on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Honor your father and your mother so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. And you should not covet your neighbor's house, shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or male or female slave, or ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. The word of the Lord. A reading from the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians. The message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom, but we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, 
and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. The word of the Lord. Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Glory to you, Christ. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, Take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. The disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. The Gospel of the Lord. exercise. When I say Ten Commandments, what do you picture? You've got like a wind-blown Charlton Heston going on in your mind? How about like the ubiquitous steel, like steel-colored tablets that are always rounded at the top? Without fail, right? In courthouses where I used to live, yard signs, I picture these billboards on Interstate 71 in Ohio, black, white writing, red flourishes that tell me about the Ten Commandments. And then for an added bonus, you get one a couple of miles later that says, hell is real, 
I don't know if it's theologically connected or not, but it does, it does break up the trip, right? <laughs> so maybe all you picture is the reading from Exodus, which maybe would be a gift to you, right? But my point is that the, the Ten Commandments have all this cultural overlay to them now. And in many ways, they've been used as like a cudgel in certain sectors of our society, which means I have kind of this knee-jerk reaction to the Exodus reading that's not all that helpful, because it, it doesn't actually take into consideration anything about the actual context in which these were given. Because the actual context, context is like people are in a desert. And they haven't been there for all that long, but they've, they've been there for enough time. And they're there because previously, months, you know, before, they were all enslaved in Egypt for generations. And they called out to God to free them. And finally, God sent Moses as God's agent to deal with Pharaoh and to lead the people out. And they kind of get out of town, and then Pharaoh's army comes, and God does this miraculous parting of the waters, and everyone goes through. And then God leads them into the wilderness by fire at night, by cloud during the day, provides them food when they're hungry, water when they're thirsty. But the wilderness is an interesting place. And you begin, after a while, to ask yourself bunches of questions, but maybe they fall into kind of two categories. How are we supposed to be in relationship with this God who called us out of Egypt? The God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, our forebearers. What is God asking of us now that we're free? And secondly, what are we as a people going to do about living together? There has been no legislative meeting. There's not a continental congress that's taken place in the wilderness, right? These are people without laws at the moment. There are people without a king. All they've got is like Moses and Aaron, and God is not setting up like a nepotistic oligarchy, right? And so they're left a little bit without parameters in their life together. And so it's God, not Moses, who gives them these Ten Commandments in that context. They are in the wilderness. Ten teachings. Our Jewish brothers and sisters would call them the Ten Words or the Ten Teachings. Ten teachings, you can remember them easily. You have ten fingers. Your children have, most likely, ten fingers, right? You can, you can t I'm not being facetious, but like, you can teach them to people. You can remember ten things. You're not in a place to write all this down. It does eventually get codified in long and drawn out laws. For your edification, I commend to you the book of Leviticus, if you're really interested. That's where they all go. But for now, they're in the desert, and there are ten key teachings that God gives. And I think thinking about them as ten words or ten teachings is a lot more helpful. Because that's the spirit in which God gives them. And the first word or the first teaching, God actually gives some context. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of slavery. I.e., I am the Lord your God who heard your cries. I am the one who rescued you. I am the one who, who's the fire at night and the, the cloud during the day, the one who gives you food and sustains you out here in the dryness. I am the one who graciously called you. And if that is true, and if that is the relationship we'd agreed upon, then don't have any other ersatz gods. Because that will break relationship. And breaking that relationship will cause all kinds of consequences for the generations. Because the choice one generation makes always impacts the next generation. And so God begins the whole thing by talking about how God will be with the people. And then, of course, there's this kind of hinge commandment, the one about Sabbath, right? If kind of the first ones are about God and people, then you have the Sabbath, which is this invitation for people to rest. It puts a parameter, a fence around the work week. Some wisdom there, right? 
take a break, take a rest from the work. And resting, too, reminds us that while we rest, the world keeps spinning. God is still in control. And that we're human beings, we're worthy of rest. And then that reminds us that we're not God, that we're all made in the image of God, and that we all live together. And the first people we live with are in a family unit that is deserving of honor and respect, particularly back when this was written. And then if everyone bears the image of God, then we shouldn't murder one another. You shouldn't lie to people in court. You shouldn't break the vows that you make. Parameters. How do we want to be with God? And how do we want to be with one another? Society can't really flourish. Maybe this is a hot take, but society can't really flourish if you've not agreed on some basic ways to be together. Who wants to go around wondering if murder's okay? Who wants to take their case to court and think that perjury is just going to happen and nothing's going to, the no consequences are going to come of it? The people need something to boundary them. But I think, too, it's not just about that. It really is about trust and relationship because these are not a set of just commandments, they're a set of teachings from God about how to be with God and how to thrive. And I'm really taken by what Walter Brueggemann, who's like the genius of the Old Testament, wrote. He says, the ten teachings are not a set of rules, but a proclamation in God's own mouth of who God is and how God will be practiced by the people. But the ten teachings are actually a gift, a gift of God's own self to the people for how then they can live in ways that everyone flourishes. You came out of slavery in Egypt. Let's not repeat that model. Let's do this utterly differently. And I think, they look, they, they come to us linearly. But I wonder for me, it's, it's not helpful maybe for you, or it's just an act of projection, to think about them as concentric, concentric circles. That what the 10 teachings do is they place God at the very center of everything. And not just any God, the God who delivers, the God who graciously calls, the God who sustains. Love the Lord your God. And when you're loving God and you know that that God loves you back, it's the center and the focus of all of the rest that kind of ripple out from that, right? If that's true, why would you want another God? Why would you break relationship? Why would you take that God's name in vain? And why would you not take a rest? Because you're not God. It doesn't depend on you. You can take a breather. And then, of course, the image of God's on everybody, so ripple that out to your family and don't murder people. And see, the center of it at all is God. And the teachings remind us that that's the core. And everything else ripples out from it. And I know I'm talking to a room full of people who confess Jesus as Christ. But these documents, they're part of our collective history. And I wonder if it's not helpful to think about them as a way to practice living God. Christians, sometimes we get our head all caught up in, do we believe the right thing? Orthodoxy. But there's a good point to be made that part of this whole thing is about orthopraxy, doing the right thing whether you feel like it or you don't, a kind of commitment to integrity. And I think that the Ten Commandments provide that to a degree, these ten teachings. If God is at the center and that's the core commitment to an integrity of our lives, then we're committed to how we want to treat one another. And that is how we end up practicing God in the world. We're not trying to earn something from God. We're not trying to be legalistic, moralistic, use these as a cudgel but his teachings for how to walk in the world in a way that keeps God in the middle, keeps integrity of self, and practices God in how we live with other people. So whatever image we have of the Ten Commandments, helpful or not helpful, I wonder if they don't provide some helpful way of thinking about how we do want to act in the world, how we do want to be in relationship with the gracious God how we do want everybody to thrive. And maybe then the 10 teachings are really helpful.
not just for those of us in this generation who practice it, but for generations to come, now and forever. We believe in one God, the Father, and the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. We will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism and forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the church and for the world. Grant, Almighty God, that all who confess your name may be united in your truth, live together in your love, and reveal your glory in the world. We pray particularly this day for St. Clement's Greenville, St. Matthias's East Aurora, and St. Peter's Eckertsville. Lord, in your mercy, guide the people of this land and of all the nations in the ways of justice and peace, that we may honor one another and serve the common good. Lord, in your mercy, Give us all a reverence for the earth as your own creation, that we may use its resources rightly in the service of others and to your honor and glory. Lord, in your mercy, bless all whose lives are closely linked with ours and grant that we may serve Christ in them and love one another as he loves us. Lord, in your mercy, Comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. Give them courage and hope in their troubles and bring them the joy of your salvation. Lord, in your mercy, we commend to your mercy all who have died, that your will for them may be fulfilled. And we pray that we may share with all your saints in your eternal kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, Almighty and eternal God, ruler of all things in heaven and earth, mercifully accept the prayers of your people and strengthen us to do your will through Jesus Christ our Lord. The peace of Christ be always with you. As we approach this table, may we remember that it belongs to Jesus Christ, who calls all to come as they are and receive what is offered, either bread and wine or a blessing. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God.
The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who was tempted in every way as we are, yet did not sin. By his grace, we are able to triumph over every evil and to live no longer for ourselves alone, but for him who died for us and rose again. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Gracious Father, in your infinite love, you made us for yourself, and when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you, in your mercy, sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and to die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, drink this all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ is dying. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
gifts of God for the people of God.
Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have been gracious as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. And the blessing of the triune God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you and remain upon you now and evermore. Let us bless the Lord.